was never good to start out with. What are you talking about? But the, the last one. Only wood actually come in, Justin. The last one. No sugar go to Jonathan. Tell us how you really feel. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some caravans. Oh, also, everybody gets a test paper. Oh. Yeah, everybody gets a test sheet. Everybody gets a test sheet. There's eight test sheets there. There should be enough for everybody. Guess what that means. i got to go get a pen. Yeah. Yeah, the last I don't want to miss, the, miss the presentation. Go get your doggone pen and do not drag your feet. Well, it'll start over here. Didn't take very long. Hurry up. We got some caravans here. A couple of caravans I'm talking about here on this. And you know, Rachel, uh, you know, fluffed up my PowerPoint presentation the other day. That's okay. All right. So the first of these two Dodge caravans came in because the transmission had a screwball shift pattern. So right. Okay. Okay, it wasn't slipping, but it didn't shift gears consistently. In other words, it shifted different work one time from another. And not only were there some shifts erratic and delayed, but there was no recognizable pattern, and sometimes the transmission would shift just fine. Transmission speed sensing. Okay. Well, it's a possibility. So what else are you thinking? You know, if it won't, what is it that makes it decide when to shift? How does it know when to shift? What does the shifting of the transmission depend on? Well, yeah, you got RPM, you got the throttle angle. You go deeper into the throttle, holds gears longer, right? All that kind of thing. So, so we got we got this other stuff. We got a screwball shift pattern on here, and the fact that it wasn't consistent was interesting too. So, what would you do first? Check the voltage on the speed sensor. The very first thing that I would do would be the easiest and most intelligent thing to do, Check and that's fluid. pull the dead gum dipstick out of it, and let's see what kind of fluids in there and what it looks like. The customer had first taken it to a transmission shop. They had advised him to have a new radiator installed because there was a bit of water mixed with the fluid. Not much, but the shop wasn't interested in doing work on the transmission, nor were they interested in replacing the radiator. Okay, now that sound feasible. Why would you turn away with work? Exactly, unless you just don't like working on a Dodge Caravan. And there is a transmission shop I know of that's a really good transmission shop on Ford's and Chevrolet around here, but won't work on a Dodge. To begin with, there was a bit of water in the fluid, but the cooler is external to the radiator. The cooler is not even in the radiator on this one. Initially, I was going to order a radiator for it, and I said, wait a minute, this thing ain't even got lines going to the radiator. They go around to a cooler that's mounted in front. So what the same hell's water doing in the transmission if the radiator is not even in the picture, right? Okay, so the replacement of the radiator was pointless. So where did the water come from? Okay, I says, maybe they drove through some really high water and it went in the vent. Because there's a vent there, you know? Can they get water in there like that? Yeah. I mean, you can drive through water high enough to where you're going to get water in the transmission, rear end, whatever else has got a vent. Because the vent's supposed to let air out, but it can also let water in. Keeps dust and stuff out for you. All right, so short of somebody pouring water through the dipstick tube, I don't know. This is a kind of a mystery. So we followed the PO700 code, and we decided we were going to do a full fluid exchange followed by a filter change to clean the pin and replace the shift solenoid assembly. So this was our PO700 that we got on my little homemade scan tool that I drew. And this right here is our machine that we got out there doing the, the, the flush. You know, we, I mean, there's a transmission where you basically you know, put a clean fluid on one side, put dirty fluid on the other side, you hook it up between the cooler line, close the valve, and it basically intercepts the fluid coming to the cooler and puts new fluid back in place of it. So you're changing all the fluid in there. Right. All right. Then we've got a solenoid pack. It's right on the front of the transmission, easy to change on these cars, and then these 41 TDs, and we put one of those on there. And that's what I told the lady that, well, it's actually a guy that drove it. And then he passed away later, and you know. Anyway, I told him. I said, uh, "What we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a full fluid exchange and filter and all, and we're going to put a solenoid pack on it. We're going to let you drive it like that and just see what happens." You know, I mean, I said this is a gamble anyway. But if we had to put a transmission in, it, we'll put a transmission in. It, but whatever. So Rick, there was a little what? Nothing. Water and a transmission make the clutch fibers separate from the steels. Maybe. It can, but because, it depends on how much is in there. Because of stuff they stick the uh, clutch fibers mm -hmm. to the disc mm -hmm. is made like so the water gets on them and make it separate. Yeah. 
some of them. They're not all just alike, though. But I see where you're coming from with that. And I did get fussed at by somebody else about that, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. There was a little bit of glitter in the pan, a little fine fuzz on the magnet. That's not so unusual for a transmission with that much on the clock, really 150,000 miles on it. Uh, after we put the transmission fluid, the filter, the shift on the line, the code was gone, the transmission shifted well. Now, this lady was having to take her husband to the Montgomery, to the hospital, I guess the VA hospital or wherever it was, uh, about twice a month from here, you know, to Montgomery, was it a little And so, twice a month, she was driving at Montgomery and back. All right, didn't hear anything else out of her. Well, I published this repair in a magazine I write for, this self-proclaimed transmission expert sent me this ugly email about our repair, talking about how stupid we were and incompetent. This was months later, by the way. And he said, the transmission should be totally rebuilt if you know, even a tablespoon of transmission of water ever makes it into the water. I, did, I put these words backward. If even a tableful of water ever makes it into the transmission fluid, you should rebuild that transmission. It was stupid to do that. You know, that stuff. So my answer, after I checked with the owner of the caravan, was that she had no trouble with it. And it's been months. Tell me again why I needed to rebuild it on a 150,000 mile vehicle. You know, I mean, they were they were good with that. You know, so anyway, they still that thing still drives. It's still there. It's been years ago, and they still drive that thing. And there's nothing wrong with it. So anyway, all right. So here's another one. Small car comes in with an NVH concern, noise, vibration, and harshness. The customer could feel the engine shaking uh, the car when it was idling. She had owned the car for a while, and the problem came about suddenly. There was a rock trapped in the motor mount there that was making it not you know, absorb the jiggle. So we found that. Inspected the engine mounts, found that. Now that one was torn a little bit, we might have put one on it, but after we put that motor mount on there, everything was good. Or we might have even taken the rock out and put that mount back on there just to see how it would do or something, I can't remember. No, no, it's torn. No, that was on a, like a, uh, I think it was a Ford Focus. Um, but uh, another vehicle came in with a complaint that it was running hot in traffic, and we tested the fan using the method that I used, and it was wide open. There was no continuity, no operation, and we found this when we disconnected the fan. Burned up the connector. You know, this thing's got a lot of current flowing through it. It starts to get hot. It starts to oxidize. Resistance builds there. It start, as the more resistance it builds, the more heat it's got. And it starts to melt things down. The oxidation increases. Snowball's out of control. Finally, current completely stops flowing, and you wind up with nothing. All right. Then there was a high-mileage Ford 15-passenger van that didn't drive quite right. The customer said it was all over the road. All right. They decided to have a couple of new tires installed on the rear and move the worn but still good tires to the front, which was a bad idea. Because the new tires they installed on the rear were a softer rubber than they should have been, even with the recommended 80 PSI pressure. And besides that, the, you know, they were sort of taller and they had a, a narrower tread signature. The front ones that they had, the one they moved from the back to the front had a wider uh, tread, you know, tread pattern on the road just because of the design of the tire. And the new tires that they put in the back caused it to feel like it was going to turn over because the tires were soft and had a different thing. So I moved the front tires that they had on the front back to the back and put the new ones back on the front, which is where they needed to be anyway. And it said it drove like a different vehicle. So just moving the tires around helped with that one there. All right. Now, here's another all-over-the-road complaint. The college owns a 2002 Crown Victoria. And y'all don't usually see that. It's a black one that we got on the other campus. Came in with a complaint that it's all over the road, the same thing. And it had come in with complaints of a popping noise and a brake squeak a couple of weeks earlier, which we fixed, but we hadn't noticed any all over the road issues on that visit. Okay, I drove the car, I could tell the front end was kind of tight. The steering almost wouldn't return to the center. You know, when you turn it, you expect it because of the, what, what makes the steering return to the center? Road run? Caster. Hmm? Caster. Caster. Because when you turn the wheel, if you actually take a tape measure, and you can do this on just about any car, take a tape measure, and you go to the front of the car and put it in a measure, mark a little spot on the bumper with a pencil or something, and turn the wheels, it picks the car up. When you come back to the middle, it goes low, and when you turn it back to the left, it picks the car up. So it's always wanting to go back to the middle. Unless there's something that's preventing it from doing that. So I uh, figured a mildly stiff steering was what it's all about. So... What we do? On the lift, with the front wheels clear of the ground, turning the steering wheel, you could tell it was stiffer than it ought to be, so we pop the tie rod ends loose from the spindles, and when you grab the spindles with the tie rods loose, they ought to just go thump, 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 like that, and they were like, Ear. so we put ball joints and tie rod ends and 
clear that one up. They still they're still driving it right now. That car got three hundred fifty thousand miles on it or something. But anyway, caravan number two came in had a rattling noise that was coming from the belt area, and it seemed to be tied to changes in engine speed. You know. Uh, so that they would seem normal till the engine was mildly accelerated in a service van and noise would come and go abruptly with changes in engine speed. It was a strange noise like I hadn't heard a lot of except I'd heard something similar to it and so I got started thinking. It always exhibited the same pattern. You could get it to do it exactly the same way every single time. And so I'm thinking, well, I've seen these things go bad. That little pulley, that's a 17 millimeter. I've actually built a little tool. Some of you guys have seen this tool I made. It's in the uh, toolbox in there where I took a, a socket, or it may have been a 19 millimeter. One way or another, I brazed it into a socket so that you could spin these alternator pulleys over. you got to pop a little plastic cap off that covers this up. We won't spin that alternator pulley off of there. It is an overrunning pulley. And so basically, if you... Uh, whenever you let off the engine, unless the alternator continues spinning at the speed it was, you know, until it inertia gins it down and all that. So when the inside of these pulleys start to give trouble, because they've got a couple of springs in there, the ones that I'm familiar with, uh, whenever they become compromised, you've got issues there. Let me get rid of this. All right. So, okay. So. That's what they kind of look like. I ground one of them apart just so you can see what's in there. It's got a couple of springs in there. And I'll show you a little better there. Uh, but uh, the springs in there, whenever, you know how when you turn a spring one way it bites and the other way it freewheels? Just because of the nature of a spring. That's just the way that is. And it's got a heavy one around the outside and a smaller one around the inside and all that. And that's what one looks like when it comes all to pieces. And, you know, on the inside I actually cut it apart so you can see what was going on there. And those springs on this one here, and this was an earlier car, not this one, they had broke. And so basically I took that apart just to see what, I always like to see if I can to cut stuff apart and see what's going on in there so I kind of got a better idea of what's happening in there. Uh, so when they fail, they make weird noises. Well, we got the alternator off, popped around cover off the pulley that conceals the Allen socket, used my homemade tool, and I felt the pulley when I got it off and I compared it to the new one, which is a $70 part, and they felt just alike. And I says, I must have gone off the rails here somewhere because I don't really see a problem with this pulley. So I said I sent it back to the park store because they keep them in stock anyway. And I put that thing back on there. And I said, you know, we need to probably raise this thing up on the lift and have a better look. We had it flat on the ground the whole time. So we put it up to remove the right front tire and splash shield and I found a problem. You know, the little pump, water pump flange is Y-shaped with three arms and a bolt hole. And you know how you take your bolts out and you turn it so you can get the pulley off there, it's kind of unusual, but if anybody's done it, you know what I'm talking about. you got to turn it 120 degrees so it drops back off the flange. That's what it looks like, and this is what we found on that. You can see it's supposed to have three little arms that look just alike, and that one was busted right there. So it only had two arms holding that pulley, and that's where that racket was coming from. I've never seen that before or since, but one of those broke. Now somebody else may have seen that, it may be more common than I know, but that's what I found on that particular vehicle. Took less than an hour to throw a water pump at it, uh, put the alternator on, do certain things about everything bled out. But the Dodge Caravan is not a very v hard vehicle to put a, a uh, water pump on, really. And so that's what we did on that. Now, just about every busy wrench trister, you stumble into situations that give you a hard time, but they make you stronger and faster and more capable every time you fight with one. And it always helps to tell another mechanic about the experience. Have you ever noticed that when you start explaining something to somebody else, you get to where you understand it better yourself? You know what I mean? It, it happens. You know, you, you burn it in better. You have to take that information, process it, turn it into words, put it out so they can understand it. And there's things you'll begin to understand you never thought about before. You know, whenever you're speaking to a group, sometimes you might notice uh, that things will come to your mind that you never thought about before while you're talking. You know what I mean? This pops into your head, the stuff I've never thought about before, but because of the way you're having to process it, you squeeze out new data. All right, so I spoke to another guy a while back to fix the Pontiac that had been everywhere for overheating problems. Nobody could figure it out. And when it pulled up, he saw the way the dust was blowing when it pulled up. And he said, somebody's got that radiator cooling fan wired up backwards so that it's blowing into the radiator instead of pulling air through it. And all he had to do was Take that aftermarket fan and switch the wires around on it and overheating problem solved. Well, you can see the things fighting the wind when you're going down the road. 
You know what I mean? So you got to make sure that you can, if you take a piece of newspaper and you put it up against the radiator, it should suck it in, or up against even a condenser. But if you put that newspaper against it and it blows it away from it, <laughs> somebody's put it on there and wired it up backwards because they feel like a fan's a fan, right? All right. Now this one here is an easy one here. Now this girl walked in here. She's parked right out there. She walked in here one day and she says, um, I've got a uh, my trailblazer. I've never seen her before. She said, it's sitting down there and it won't start. And it was like 4 o'clock. Everybody's gone. You know? So I said, well, let me see what I got on this thing. So I walked out there and... Uh, Got it now. Nah, 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 nah. So I like plug in a scan tool, pull up the RPM signal. Nah, 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 nah. It's reading zero. Well, you can stand flat footed by that fender with a hood open and reach down there and change that sensor. So I called Brett, said, You got a sensor $16. So he sends it over here. She gives the parts person $16 and whatever the tax was. We stuck it in there and you know, <laughs> fired it right up. That didn't take 15 minutes. You know, it's really easy to do that one. And uh, the thing about it is, she had been beat up and overcharged by other mechanics and shops and stuff, and I don't know why or which shops they were, but she thought I was some kind of superman because I fixed a car for $16 in 15 minutes. Just about a dollar a minute, I guess. Uh, the next problem she has, my snag is around. She did bring that thing back later for some other things, and it wasn't quite as easy the other time. But she trusted us. One time, and this is a true story, Farmer dropped his truck off at the Ford place and gave the cashier a blank check. Had it written up. Said, my truck's skipping and I want it fixed. What do you think is going to happen if you go to a car dealership and you hand them a blank check with your signature on the bottom line and say, fix my truck? That's pretty daggum scary, isn't it? But that's what he did. I don't know what he was thinking, but they gave me the ticket and they said, did you know this guy gave us a blank check? When I got through with it, I surgically repaired what was wrong, didn't have very much wrong with it, and he wound up paying a bill that was less than 50 bucks. It wasn't very much. All right, there's another little <laughs> situation here I'm going to tell you about. Happened back in... 1980, I guess. Um, this guy, this guy's, uh, this woman I was working with was a dispatcher at a company I worked for, and she said, "Jerry has got a '78 uh, Chevrolet something. It was a little car with a straight six, you know, hot water six, and a little one barrel carburetor on it." And she says, "And uh, so he went to uh, this tune-up place over there, and they tuned it up." And it ran okay for a couple of days and it started acting up. So we took it back over and I said, well, you got a carburetor problem. We don't work on carburetors. And so he said, well, fiddlestick. So he took it to another place and they put a scope on it. They put a vacuum gauge on it. And they said, we're going to uh, have to put a carburetor on here. And he goes, golly, I don't have to put a carburetor on here. And she says, can you rebuild the carburetor on Jerry's car? And I said, yeah, but I haven't even seen the car. And um, I still want to be paid even if it's not fixed. If you want me to just rebuild the carburetor. She said, well, what do you, what do you, what do you propose? I said, I'll fix whatever's wrong with 50 bucks. I don't care what it is. For 50 bucks, I'll fix it. And she said, hmm, okay. So I got out, I walked, I went out there to where it was. I wasn't working at a shop, but I was working for maintenance on cars and trucks and everything for a company. So basically, I was working in a maintenance, vehicle maintenance. So I went out there and I pulled a little one barrel carburetor off of it. Got a Delco carburetor kit for $6. Cleaned the carburetor up with some carburetor spray. You know, put it all back together. The little idle mixture screw had a tip broke off of it. I put that all in there, got it all adjusted out and everything, put it back on and, and uh, revved it up. You know, that's the first time I'd ever even started it up. I revved it up and uh, when I revved it up, I heard it dropping a cylinder. And so I fooled with the plug wires until I found out it was dropping number three. And I took that spark plug out. It was a brand new spark plug. They had that tune-up franchise's name on it. And I dropped it in my toolbox and I got an old rusty spark plug that would fit. And I screwed it in there and it boom, boom, boom. All it was was a bad spark plug. And two shops had told him it needed a carburetor. And so uh, I said, and they wanted like $150 or something. He paid out a bunch of money already getting in trouble shot, see? The tune up in the other shop, I charged a bunch of money. So I said, he said, well, what do I owe you? I said, $50. He said, really? And I said, yeah, $50. That was the deal. I mean, I fixed whatever was wrong with it for $50. Bucks. That's what you agreed to. So he gave me $50. Well, it was a $6 carburetor kit, and his problem was fixed. See what I'm saying? That's basically, I mean, without even seeing the car. See, I could have been in trouble because it could have been a lot worse, and it could have cost me something to do it. Anyway. Uh, but I performed a surgical repair on that, fixed his concern, his bill was less than 50 bucks, and he, he was a good customer. He came back a lot of times because he didn't get the shaft. So you want to find out what kind of integrity somebody has, give them a blank check. You know what I mean? Yeah, because they'll clean your plow if you really careful. What kind of concern can be caused by this? Now, after this is our test question, so be ready with your pen. Oil. Who sees the problem? Compression rings have wound up. Yeah, what does that mean? 
Or it ain't going to have no compression on that song. Because the rings is lined up. It's going to go past those little ring gaps. They're supposed to be on opposite sides of the piston. Right? I mean, so if you put them, and basically, and that like, well, that oil scraper ring don't look all that great either, but it would probably work okay. But this is the problem I was trying to talk about right here. When you got those lined up, that's a problem. All right, here we go. Test question one. Engine sludge can bring about oil starvation that leads to bearing failure and can be caused by what? Yeah, circle the answer on your sheet. Whichever one you think it is. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. EGR system failure can cause what? Higher Mark your answer, hurry up. Getting close to lunch. Test question number three. The technician has been led by diagnostic trouble codes to investigate fuel trim numbers that are as follows. Short fuel trim, 0%. Long fuel trim, 27%. All right, what do we got here? A, the fuel filter may be restricted. B, the crankcase oil may be contaminated with fuel. C, the fuel pressure may be low. Or D, any of the above. All right, question number four. If an engine is knocking due to rod bearing failure, it could be due to what? A, rust clogged injectors. B, Plugged EGR passages, C, broken relief valve spring or a struck relief valve, or any of the above. Question five. Technician A says an engine oil pump is a positive displacement pump. Technician B says all engine oil pumps turn at half crankshaft speed. Who is correct there? We're going to back up and go over these again after you trade papers in a minute. We're going to move it pretty quick through this. These are ASE style questions. The technician A says a bad radiator cap can cause rust and corrosion buildup in a car's cooling system. Technician B says a large pipe on a heater core is generally the heater core's inlet pipe. Question number six. Technician A says most coolant systems call for a 50-50 mix of coolant and distilled water. Technician B says water pumps are driven by the back surface of the serpentine belt and a water pump driven by the engine timing belt generally spin in opposite directions. If it's driven by the back side of the serpentine belt as opposed to the timing belt, which way will that mean? Do they spin in opposite directions or no? Everybody ready to move on? Well, we got to have a couple of minutes to check it. So, uh, technician A says the injector firing frequency is directly tied to crankshaft sensor input. Technician B says that on an engine with a crankshaft sensor and a distributor, improper distributor rotor alignment can be corrected by adjusting the ignition timing. Who's correct about that? This question and one more. The technician is investigating a no start condition on a vehicle with the following pin values. Intake air temperature, 100 degrees. Engine coolant temperature, 45. Barometric pressure, 28. Transmission oil temperature, 47. TPS, 8 tenths of a volt. B plus volt, 12 and a half. What's the most likely reason for the no start? Faulty barrel sensor, a weak throttle position sensor, an open IAT sensor circuit, or none of the above. He needs to check more pits. A $42 inside door handle on a 2005 Nissan Sentra is being replaced for a quoted labor price of $350. Technician A says the labor price is appropriate because of skill level required to do the job. Technician B says parts and service providers should set their prices based on whatever they know the customer is willing to pay. Everybody done? 
Yep. Trade papers with somebody. Do it now. Everybody trade papers with somebody, right? Yeah, I got it. All right. The answer to question A. Question A. I meant to say question one instead of question A. You know, if you want to go alphabet. Any of the above. That should be D. If somebody didn't put D, mark it wrong. The answer to question two is any of the above. Higher cylinder combustion temperatures, because this is supposed to cool the combustion chamber. Pinging or detonation, higher NOx emissions, or any of the above. It's supposed to be D. All right? Any of the above. Can cause this. Fuel filter may be restricted. That's basically causing it to run lean, so it's adding fuel. The crankcase wall may be contaminated with fuel. Actually, that's a screwed up question, because this one is not feasible. This one is not right. That would make this go negative, right? So the fuel pressure may be low. So these yeah. two, this one here should read either A or C. So that's right? a freebie then? Yeah, so basically either A or C. So that's a freebie. Ooh, yeah. okay. freebie. That's a freebie. It's a freebie. All right. If an engine is knocking due to rod bearing failure, it could be due to what? Rust clogged injectors cause that? Plugged EGR passage would cause that. Broken relief valve spring. That's in the oil pump, in case you wanted to know. This right here will cause it, but not that. So this should be C. Somebody didn't put C, slap yourself. Okay. Oil pump supplies the displacement pump, true or false? That's true. Technician B says all engine oil pumps turn at half crankshaft speed. Is that true? No. That's false. Because some of them are on the crankshaft itself. <laughs> some of them are driven by the camshaft. If they're driven by the camshaft, they turn a half crankshaft feet. Right. Okay. So basically, technician A is the only one that's right there. That should be A. The answer to that would be A. Technician A says a bad radiator cap can cause rust and corrosion buildup in a car's cooling system. What do you think? Possibly. Think about this. If you're letting the air just come and go as it pleases, you're going to have a mess. Right? If you let an air just come and go out of that cooling system as it wants to, it will clog that thing up with rust and crud like you've never seen. Technician B says the large pipe on a heater core is usually the inlet, inlet pipe. Is that right? No. All right. So A is right on that one. That should be A. Technician A says most cooling systems call for 50-50 mix. That one's true, right? Mm -hmm. Most of them. Technician B says water pump driven by the back surface of the serpentine belt. They're going to turn the opposite direction from the engine. Right? The timing belt is typically got the teeth driving the pump. Right? And it's going to turn the same direction. Now, if, if you've ever seen one where they're the same pump can fit one with either been driven by the back or the forward, you got to make sure, look at those impeller, they may be backwards if you've got one that way, some of the old Jeeps were yeah. like that. Okay. Technician A says, huh? Did I give you an answer? I'm no, he did not. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so this guy, this guy's right. Technician A, And this guy's right too. So there's going to be a both. That should be a C. Yeah. Technician A says injector firing frequency is directly tied to the crankshaft sensor input. Technician B says that on an engine with a crankshaft sensor and a distributor, improper distributor rotor alignment can be corrected by adjusting the ignition timing. This is firing frequency, how often they click is directly tied to crankshaft speed. But the pulse width is different based on load and other things. Uh, on an engine with a crankshaft sensor, the crankshaft sensor determines the timing. You cannot adjust that. You can turn the distributor, like on one of the little CSFIs or some of the ones like that or some of the Jeeps. You can turn the distributor. You're not going to change the time in turning the distributor. Why does, why does turning the distributor change the timing on the older ones? Is it because of where the rotor's pointing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Because it's because of where the point, when the point's open or when the reluctor. That's what's changing it because that's where the signal's generated. The rotor alignment is just happens to be lined up with that on the ones that have a reluctor 
or a, you know, the, in other words, the old can. But on these with a crankshaft sensor, you can turn your distributor, but you're not going to change the timing that way. You're just going to screw up the way it runs. You'll make it butt hunt going down the road and all kinds of stuff like that. So basically, this one right here, technician A, is the right one on that one. 